waste your time with religion. Stop wasting your time with rebellion. It's not working. All this is, is imperfect people pursuing a perfect God. Let's go build front porches to welcome them home as if to say, come and experience what this God believes about you. He is so much better than you know. When we are broken and desperate, we can run straight to Jesus. We don't have to hide our brokenness. We don't have to hide our hurt. I know what God has brought me through. I know where he's going to take me through and I know what he wants to do for me. So I will live obedient. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. I don't care what culture says or the political leaders say. I know who he is because of who he said he was. And God says, I don't want you to watch somebody else be a part of this thing. I want you to be a part of this thing. I want you to experience my power, experience my love, experience what it feels like to walk in your calling with some confidence, because we got to walk out of here and go change the world, church.
right, come on, that's a half a cup of coffee sound. Let's lift up a holy sound. Let's go, let's go. We're about to have church today. You guys feeling good? We are imperfect people pursuing a perfect God. And all the imperfect, all the imperfect people said, amen. We exist to make heaven more crowded by helping people to know God and live on purpose so that together we can go change the world. And really quick, um, actually, let's do one thing. We're not sitting down just yet, but I do need y'all to scoot in and fill every chair in this room. We're gonna fill every seat. Let's help our usher team out and uh, let's make some noise for our usher team. If you're an usher at the 1015, on the parking team at the 1015, you're a hero, you're a legend, and we love you. Um, I'm gonna give you one way that you can change the world for somebody this week. We, uh, we collaborate with a few different organizations locally, nationally, globally, who can major on all the stuff that we could only ever minor on, on our own. And one of those is a group called the Arms of Hope of the Refuge Ranch, right in our own backyard. And what they do is they, they take in single women and their children and equip them with the necessary resources and tools to be sent back out in a way that they can thrive. So they help them with GEDs and with mental health stuff and, and, and teach them how to budget. And, and what we're gonna do over the next couple of weeks is a holiday drive for them. And so if God puts this on your heart, I wanna invite you to stop by the little Christmas tree on the table in the lobby right by the Merch Mart, and you can get a little paper ornament, and on that ornament's gonna be written something for you to go buy and bring back next weekend or the weekend after, like kitchen supplies or a toy, or if you don't get an ornament, they're also asking for gift cards to Amazon, HEB, and Walmart, or just bring diapers and wipes. How many? All of them. Just bring the most amount of diapers and wipes that you possibly can. And so that's one simple way that you can change the world for somebody over the next couple of weeks. Today is week three of this family teaching series we do at the end of every single year called Kingdom Builders. And um, what we do is, and if you're a guest, this is not for you to participate in. This is for you to simply watch. I'm so glad that you're here, maybe even more so than like Easter, because today you get to see what this church is really all about. You get to watch an uncommon group of real people just like you with real bills to pay and real burdens just like you do something that seems illogical, kind of crazy, or maybe even a little bit irresponsible if God is not real and that's live with an uncommon kind of sacrifice and generosity. And I want you just to watch it on display and let it build your faith. If you're in here and you have church baggage around the, the topic of generosity or giving, my only prayer for you today is supernatural healing that God would do a healing in your heart as you see this topic handled, maybe in a way that you've never seen it handled before. That's sincerely my prayer for, for you in, in this room today. Um, this message is gonna be brought to us by Sean Johnson. He is the senior pastor of all of Red Rocks Church. And if you don't know this, we have locations way beyond just the 1015 in Austin. There's four other services that we do here. And then on top of that, we have locations in Colorado. We have a, a campus in Brussels, Belgium, of all places. We have the ladies at the Lane Murray unit. Can we give it up for the ladies at the Lane Murray unit? And four other correctional facilities in Colorado. And these messages go into small groups and living rooms all in countries, literally all over the world. And, um, and at all these other locations, pretty much every service, the sermon's on a screen. And it's always live and in person here. And today's gonna be the switch. And, uh, and I think you're actually gonna find how, like you're, you're gonna see why in just a second. If you don't know this about me, one of the coolest parts about my job, about once a month, I get to travel to Denver to record sermons for all those locations. So I'm always bringing a little bit of ATX to Denver, but today we're gonna do one thing we really never do, and that's bring some of Denver to Austin. And uh, Sean Johnson, he is, um, one of the main reasons for why this church in Austin exists. He is my pastor. He is one of my best friends. 
and he lives out what he's about to talk about better than anybody I've ever seen and handles this topic better than any communicator I've ever seen on the entire planet. And I'm not just saying that. And so we're gonna worship for one more song and then uh, the screen's gonna come down and I, I think you're gonna find about 40, 45 seconds in that you don't even notice. You'd be surprised how much you watch me on that screen even when I'm right here anyways. And so we're gonna go to church. And what I mean by that is the ladies at the Lane Murray unit watch church on a screen every single Saturday. And honestly, they kind of put us to shame a little bit with how they go to church and how excited they get. They'll shout Ethan down on a screen even when the point's not that good. And so that's my challenge. Let's go to church today and let's bring an atmosphere of faith into this room. And, um, and I, guys, this is gonna be a special day of church. Heaven has gotten so much more crowded this weekend. Um, and, and you're about to see why. And so I'm, I'm grateful that you're here and I wanna pray for you and then we're gonna worship and we're gonna get into it. So God, we love you so much. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Right now, I pray for a spirit of invitation and a spirit of healing and a spirit of faith in this room. As we put our hope in you, would you renew our strength? In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. I don't want to chase the wind. I was born to breathe you in. Holy Spirit, come in.
Red Rocks Church, how we feel? Oh, you look good. Hey, can you guys help me and make some crazy noise? Let's welcome all the Denver locations. We love you so much. I need you to go bananas. The Austin, Texas location is joining us live today. What's up, Austin? We love you so much. Men and women at our correctional facility campuses, we love you like crazy. And everybody watching online, high five somebody, have a seat. Let's get into this. We are in week two of a teaching series called Kingdom Builders. How good was Doug last week? I agree, very mediocre, that's about appropriate. Um, no, um, if this is your church, you know all about this series. If it's not, you're gonna find out. Um, we do this thing, and we've been doing it for several years. Uh, in fact, when we started almost 20 years ago, can you believe that, church? We're gonna be 20 years old in January. For 20 years, we've been saying we are going to be a jitterous church. We're not gonna talk about it, we're gonna be about it. And, and we do this thing at the end of every year where in Q4, when the rest of the world is so tempted to kind of hold on to everything we have, just so tight-fisted, right? We say, uh-uh, that's not who we're called to be. We're called to be a generous people. We're called to go change the world. So we're gonna open our hands like this and go, God, and here's a question. And, and my challenge is, if this is your church, you'd be praying about this. This is the question we're asking God. God, based on everything you've done for us, what could I give this year to build your kingdom and not just mine? That's the question. And on, I think it's December 8th, we're gonna bring all of our gifts together and we're gonna go reach more people, tell more people about Jesus, make heaven more crowded, help more hurting people. It's who we are, it's who we're called to be. And I love getting to be a part of this church family with you. Somebody make some noise as if that's all really, really exciting to you. <laughs> there we go. Hey, some of you are like, wait a sec. You telling me we're about to talk about money? We are. <laughs> we are, but relax. In fact, we're going to get into this word that you've probably heard a bunch around church called the tithe today. And you've probably heard it said in phrases like tithes and offerings. And are those two things the same? Are they different? Is tithing, is it just giving? Is it, I hear generosity. I hear all these words thrown together. Are they the same thing? Is, is this Old Testament stuff? Is this New Testament stuff? Is this something I need to be a part of? If so, why? And we're gonna ask the question that I started asking the second I heard about this stuff. And this is actually the title of today's talk, if you're taking notes. And the title is, Why Does God Want My Money? You ever ask that question? I, I don't know. It, I have, and, and I have uh, a lot. And I'm just gonna be honest about it today. And we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna get into it. And so I'm excited. I'm glad you're here. If you're checking this place out, I think you've come on the perfect week. Because here's what you're going to find out. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of us at campuses in different states and different countries. And, and, and a whole bunch of us would tell you the same thing, which is we so believe that God has changed our life that we're actually excited about bringing what God has given us and freely giving it back to him and saying, let's go tell more people. Let's help more people experience the life change through Jesus that we've experienced. That's what this church is about. You're going to find that out today. So I'm so glad you're here. Now, I do know this. Anytime money gets talked about, it can be a little awkward. And I used to think, man, that's just church. You know, we get weird when we talk about money in church. But what I've come to learn, at least about myself, is it's not just church. You could be at Chili's and talk to me about my money, and I'm going to get a little bit awkward. Do you know what I mean? Like, one of my best friends in the world is my financial advisor. I spend the whole Q4 every year dodging meetings with him because I don't want to sit down with him because I know he wants to tell me what to do with my money. And I love him and I know he's got my best interest at heart. I just don't like people telling me what to do with my money and maybe you don't. I know when we, when we get into this stuff, there's a whole bunch of you that are excited. I know that because like our legacy team, which is a group of people who say, I have the gift of giving. That's how I'm called to serve this church. And by the way, if you feel like that could be you, Go find your campus pastor and ask them about your campus's legacy team. But they met literally today before service just to talk about how excited they are about this year-end offering, about reaching more people, about making heaven more crowded, about doing it through finances. Like, I know a bunch of you are excited about this. But I know there's also people who you 
here we're talking about money and you go, I don't know that I fall into the excited category, right? And maybe I might be more in the I'm a little angry right now category. And I get that. Um, I didn't go to church a ton growing up, but the handful of times we did go as a family, if the pastor even mentioned money, my stepdad would say minimum 27 cuss words on the way from the church to the car. That's just how we get to the car. When we get in the car, then he really cuts loose about what he thinks. Like, I get it. I understand it. And uh, I've, I've been in your seat. I have felt excited before. I have felt really angry before. In fact, I'm going to tell you a funny story about that next week. So I get it. And so here's what I want to say. As we get into this topic, no guilt. No guilt today. This is not about we should be doing something that we're not. or This is all about opportunity. And as we get into this subject on tithing, I want you to know this. Whether or not you do this or don't, it will not change the love that God has for you right now. God loves you so much just the way you are right here, right now. His son died on a cross just so he could have a relationship with you in the here and now and in heaven forever. And whether or not you ever do any of the stuff we talk about today, God's love doesn't change for you. Deal? We good? All right. Now, you may think, well, Sean, if you already know it's awkward for some people, why talk about it? I asked the same question this week. Because <laughs> you think it's awkward for you, you ought to stand up here and hold this thing <laughs> and look at you looking at me. <laughs> Why talk about it? I'll give you three quick reasons and then we're going to jump in. Number one is I know without a shadow of a doubt I'm called to be the pastor of Red Rocks Church right now. Now, I oftentimes question his judgment on that call, okay? I'm just going to be honest. But I know it's who I'm called to be. And, and, but I also, I'm also just a person. Like, I want people to like me. I want you to like me. I want you to hug me afterwards and go, great job. I want you to be nice to me on Instagram. <laughs> but more than wanting to be your friend and more than wanting to be your social media buddy, I want to be your pastor. And, and so I feel like I have to talk about these things. And honestly, a pastor talked to me about this shortly after I gave my life to God. And I was very angry in the moment. And a year later, I went back and hugged the person and said, thank you so much for having the courage to talk to me about something I didn't want to hear about because it's changed my life. That's my hope. You probably won't want to hug me today. Find me in a year and tell me how things are going. And uh, we'll celebrate together. I know I'm called to be your pastor. And so I want to talk about this today from that point of view. Um, it's really important to God. Uh, he talks about giving over 2,000 times in the Bible. He talks about it more than prayer, more than heaven, more than hell, more than faith. Like He knows how tempted we as humans are to put all of our hope and trust and security in the money we have or the money we wish we had. And, and, he, and he's trying to help us let loose of that so that we can put our hope and security and trust in him. Jesus tells 38 stories, or we, we now call them parables, uh, about the kingdom of heaven, 16 of them, almost half, are about money and our stuff. That's how important this topic is to God. So we gotta talk about it. And lastly, I could stand up here for hours and bore you to death with story after story after story of after financial obedience, I'd never felt closer to God. And after financial obedience, I'd never seen more miracles in my life, in my own world, in my family, in our church. I could take this mic to campuses all around and thousands of people would grab the mic and go, let me tell you how it changed my life and my family and my company. Like, it's that important. And so I thought, well, what kind of pastor would I be if I avoid this topic just because it could be awkward? I believe that would be doing you a disservice. So with all that fluffy stuff being said, let's pray and let's get into it. God, thank you so much. We love you. We know that you're with us. You know everything we're going through right now. You know our past. You know our thoughts and feelings about this subject. You know where we're at financially. You know where we want to be. You know our apprehensions. God, I pray you put every single person at ease, that we just feel peace, joy, and opportunity. And God, speak to every single one of us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. You guys ready? I'm 24 years old. Not currently, <laughs> very close, but um, 24 years old, just had given my life to God. I'm sitting down with the pastor's wife because she ran the young adults ministry and I was a young adult and she's realizing that I'm a wreck. I had 
literally just almost taken my own life a few months earlier. Um, I, was, I was abusing drugs and just having a lot of problems with anxiety and depression. And, and, and I'd given my life to God. And then she was trying to help me just in life. And she noticed that my finances were also a wreck. I was $60,000 in debt. I had credit card bills and college loans that I hadn't made payments on in forever. Uh, I had very little to my life. Like, I lived in L.A. Me and my roommate had bought a bunch of furniture, but I left, so he kept it all. I wrecked my car, didn't have insurance. So I moved to Illinois, and everything I owned literally fit in two cardboard boxes. And I didn't even have a suitcase. Just put two boxes on the plane. I lived at a friend's house because I had no money to get my own spot. And, and they had a little place. So I, I was staying in their hallway going to a back porch, living on a futon. Who sleeps on a futon? Me and Michael Scott. That's it. We're the only ones. So, like, I'm a mess. She's trying to help me create a budget. And she's doing all the things, you know, gas money, food money, pay on your bills, la, la, la. And then she writes this word at the top in all caps, tithe. I said, what is a tithe? She said, oh, we bring our first 10% of everything we make back to God. I said, you do? I don't know if you heard me. I got nothing. Why does God want my money? Right? And she goes, oh, honey, let's read the Bible. Red Rocks Church, let's read the Bible. Malachi 3, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough to store it. Doug said something interesting last week. He said, definitions matter. And I thought that was so, um, I just thought that was brilliant and it's been, been sticking out to me in my mind all week long and I thought that's very true. As we talk about the tithe, definitions matter. What exactly is the tithe and what is the tithe not? That's what I want to talk about today, okay? So we're going to start with what the tithe is not. If you're taking notes, point number one, tithing is not just about our money. We're asking the wrong question. I think what we're going to find out is God doesn't want our money. He wants our life. In fact, Jesus says it like this. He says, where your treasure is, talking about our money and our stuff, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, we need to understand that when the Bible talks about this word heart, we hear heart and we think of the organ, right? When they say heart, when the Bible says heart, it's this word cardia, and it means mind, will, emotions. In fact, let me, let me read you a good definition. Cardia. Cardia is used metaphorically to refer to the inner self, encompassing the mind, will, emotions, and moral center of a person. It's not limited to the physical organ, but represents the core of human identity and spiritual life. See what Jesus is saying. Sometimes we say like, it's, it's, it's me, it's who I am, it's my soul, it's, it's the core, right? That's what Jesus is talking about. He's not saying our, our physical organ or even just our attention follows our money. No, he says everything about you. It's crazy how important he seems to think this subject is. He said everything about you, your mind, your will, your emotions, that's where our faith is. That's where our peace and joy and anxiety and depression and confidence and lack thereof and faith and all of it. He says everything you are actually goes in the direction of your finances. And then the Bible, go, God in the Bible goes way out of his way to show us how this works. And you'll have to read these two on your own, but in, uh, let's see, where is it at? In Mark 10, there's a guy that Jesus has this interaction with, and we now call him the rich young ruler. In fact, in your Bible heading, it'll probably say rich young ruler. And this guy has an experience with Jesus, and Jesus is very specific with him on what he wants him to do with his finances, and, and because he's so rich, because he's got so much of his hope and security attached to his stuff and his money, he looks at Jesus and he goes, I can't. I got too much stuff. It's too much a part of who I am. And he doesn't do what Jesus asks him to do with his finances. And it says that he went away sad and we never hear about him again. Because of having a bunch of money, this guy missed out on everything God had in store for him, went away sad, and as far as purpose goes, we don't know, but we never hear about him. Now, contradict that 
with um, a guy named Zacchaeus. If you've been in church, you may have heard about him. He's a short little dude. And um, it's in Luke 19, but he's a shady businessman, but he's also rich. And he has an encounter with Jesus. And the first thing he does is he says, I want to give. And he, in fact, he gives half of everything he has away. He says, I want to I give back to the people I've wronged. I want to get generous. I want to make it right. I want to build your kingdom. And Jesus looks at him and says, salvation has come to this house. Life change has come to this house. And you want to talk about a purpose-filled change of direction life? He died over 2,000 years ago. We're still talking about him today. That's the kind of purpose God had on his life. But he experienced it. He experienced the fullness of what God had for him because his finances went toward the kingdom of God and went toward the things of God, and it changed the direction of his entire life. So the first thing I want us to all understand is when we're talking about giving, tithing, generosity, all of it, God doesn't want our money. He wants our life. Because he knows if he has our life, that's where we start to get the fruits of the Spirit. That's where we live with his presence. That's where we get the confidence to go through anything this world can throw at us. That's where peace, joy, purpose is found. That's what he wants. He doesn't want our money. He wants our life. Number two, you guys still good? I mean, we're talking about money in church. We all still good? All right, all right. Tithing's not just about our money. Number two, tithing is not just Old Testament law. Some of you are like, talk to me. I know you because, see, when I first was told about the tithe, I hadn't been in church long enough to know that that was even something I could argue. It took a while. I had to become a professional churchgoer before I heard that argument. But after being in church for a while, a guy came up to me one day and he goes, you know, you don't have to tithe. And I said, really? Talk to me, Rick. He goes, bro, that's Old Testament. I said, pardon? He goes, yeah, that's Old Testament stuff. That's, that's in the past, bro. That's not for us today. I went, thank you. I didn't want to do this anyways. And so I kind of stopped. And if someone were to ask me, like, why'd you stop tithing? I'd be like, oh, bro, that's Old Testament. I'm more of a New Testament guy myself, just who I am. Really? Where'd you hear that? Rick. You look into it for yourself? Mm-mm. Rick knows. That's all I needed. Maybe you've heard that. And it sounds pretty good unless you actually look into it. It's just not true. Tithing is not just an Old Testament law thing. In fact, over 500 years before there ever even was an Old Testament law, Abraham tithed to the priest Melchizedek. Jacob tithed. He wakes up from this dream. He has this moment with God, and he wakes up and he says, if God's with me, if he's doing this in my life, and if he's going with me, from now on, he gets a tenth of everything I have. That was way before the law. And, and it's also in the New Testament. Now, I know some people today, I've actually talked to some people, they're like, I don't know what I believe these days, especially when it comes to the Bible and X, Y, and Z. I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I'm more of a New Testament guy. I'm more of a Jesus person. You ever hear that? I, I, don't, I'm, I just, I, I care about what Jesus says. If Jesus doesn't talk about it, eh. You know that guy? It's Rick's cousin. All right, so if that's you, you're in luck because Jesus talks about the tithe. Isn't that good news? <laughs> Someone's like, not really. Matthew 23 and Luke 11, he talks about this, says the exact same thing. Let me read one of them to you. Matthew 23, 23. What sorrow awaits you? He's talking to these real religious people, but they're, they're not actually pursuing the things that Jesus thinks are important, but they're going through the motions. Here's what he says. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites? For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. But you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, faith. Red letter in your Bible, red letters, Jesus speaking. You should tithe. Yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Tithing is not just about our money. Tithing is not just an Old Testament law thing. And this one's going to rock you for just a second, but let me explain. Tithing is not generosity. See, sometimes we get this confused. Now, just for this point alone, pretend I'm not talking to you, okay? I'm not telling you to do anything today. I'm telling you what I would tell my boys, 
okay? And you, so you just go, I'm not going to get mad at the dude. He's just telling me what he would tell his boys, and he can parent however he wants. That's an easier way of thinking about this, okay? Tithing, I would tell my boys, guys, tithing's not generosity. It's obedience. There's a difference. My son, Ethan, just bought his first condo. And I gave him my debit card recently. And he was, he, was, he was moving in. I gave him my debit card. And I said, you can take my debit card to Home Depot. I had some shingles in my garage that I didn't need. I just bought them. I said, you can return the shingles. You can use that money to buy. He needed a bunch of light bulbs. I'm like, you can use that money to buy light bulbs for your condo. And if you need a little bit more, you can use the debit card for the light bulbs. And then bring me back my card. That was over a month ago. <laughs> he gave me my card yesterday. True story. Now, when he brought me back my card, was he being generous? No. It's okay to say it. No. He wasn't being generous. It was my card. He was just being obedient. I'd already told him to bring it back. That's how God feels about the tithe. He's like, guys, I've already told you to bring that part back. I'm giving you everything you have, even the ability to produce the wealth you have or the wealth you will one day have. I'm asking you, I'm commanding you, bring back the first 10% of it and then watch me do more with the 90 than you could ever dream possible. Watch me open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing. Now, he's not promising to make everybody rich. He just says, watch me bless your life in ways you won't even be able to contain. It's a command, right? My son wasn't generous because he brought my debit card back. He was obedient. Tithing isn't generosity. It's obedience, it's not just about our money. It's not just Old Testament law. And it's not generosity. That's different. This is just obedience. Now let's talk about what tithing is. Tithing, number one, tithing is returning. That's why it's about obedience. Let me read you a couple verses that take place right before that Malachi passage that we first read that, that tells us to tithe. Watch what God says. Malachi 3, this is verses 6 and 7. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Watch this. Return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? And then in verse 10, he answers the question, and that's where we started. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. It's returning. He doesn't say, sow the tithe. He doesn't say, give the tithe. He says, bring it back to where you got it from. Return the first 10%. It's obedience and it's returning. Uh, Deuteronomy 10 says this, look, the highest heavens and the earth and everything in it all belong to the Lord your God. He says, everything is mine. Don't play games with me and pretend you're being generous with me when you're just doing what I've asked. I've asked you. I've commanded you. Bring the tithe back. Return the tithe. You're not sowing it. You're returning it. Sowing it's what happens after we tithe. Generosity is what happens after we tithe. He says, this part's returning. My, my son Ashton just turned 16. Some of you know him. And he just started driving. God help us all. Watch yourselves, Littleton. He's around here. If I give him my truck, I let him borrow my truck, and he takes it for the day and goes to school and goes to practice and does all this stuff. Can you imagine if my son came back, got home, came into the kitchen and goes, Dad, Dad, come here, come here, come here, Dad. I'm feeling really generous today, Dad. And he holds up my truck key, and he goes, I want to give you something. I want to sow this into your ministry out of the generosity in my heart. I'm going to choke him out. <laughs> You're not giving me anything. That's my truck. You are returning it. I gave it to you in the first place. That's how God sees the tithe. It's returning. Tithing is returning. Tithing is 10%. Some of you are like, duh. No, 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 no. We got to talk about this. Because we throw this word tithe around as if it has all kinds of meanings when the actual word literally means 10th. Again, Doug said this last week, definitions matter. 
What we mean when we say a word changes everything about what we're talking about and what happens because of what we're talking about. Let me give you an example of, of how important definitions are. If I were to say, I ask my boys every week, what'd you think of church? And they give me all kinds of responses. Here's something that I might get from my boys. Go ahead and put that up. Doug's message last week was low-key great, no cap. He talked about girl math, and I was like, I'm dead. The song he picked after the message slapped. Bro ate down. Some of you are laughing because your parents are like, I've heard some of those words, and I don't know what they mean. Unless you are in the youth group, which, hey, youth group students, what's up? I love seeing you on the front row. Unless you are one of these guys in young adults or 75% of the Austin location, you have no idea what I just read. <laughs> Let me bring out the decoder ring and help you. Let's put up some definitions. Low key. I actually got some of these answers from my son, Ethan. I go, Ethan, send me all the words you use that I don't understand. Here's what he sent me. Something is subtle, dad. It's chill. That was low key a good message, meaning solid job, buddy. No cap just means I'm not lying. I'm dead. To describe something is funny. I hear all the time my kids talking, they're like, I'm dying. If they text you, I'm dying, more than likely they think what you said was funny. If I text it to you, send a paramedic, all right? That's the difference. <laughs> Let's keep going. Slaps. Oh, this one's funny. Something that is desirable. This new worship song, Slaps. I'll never forget the first time me, Corey, and Tyler were always texting about the songs, especially after the message. And the, the, I'll never forget the first time they sent me a text and they're like, bro, wait till you hear this song after the message. It slaps. And I was like, I want to be cool. So I just want to say cool. But I also don't know what they're talking about. And there's going to be new people at church. And is this appropriate? Whatever they're planning do you know what I mean? Like, do we want this? <laughs> and they finally explained it to me. And, and this is fun. I just used it for the first time ever myself this week. I was in the gym. Tyler sent me the song they're going to play after the message. And I texted him back. I was so proud of myself. I went, is it going to slap? <laughs> and he probably read it and went, stop trying so hard. <laughs> but he was nice. And he texted me back. He goes, yes, bro. It's what we do. <laughs> Slaps. That's a great, great song. Eight Down, this one's brand new to me. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Eight Down. I heard this and thought they were talking about a buffet. It's just an appreciation for an action or an outfit. I'm still not cool enough to say Eight Down. I don't think I'll ever say that to anyone. But a girl on our staff named Jada, who's like 100 times cooler than me, she came up to me recently and she was talking to me about and some outfits that me and Jill had just worn at an event. And she comes, she comes up to me and she's like, SJ, you guys ate down. And I was like, I ate too much. Did I, do I look pudgy? Is that what, I'm, I'm getting pudgy. I know, I'm, I know, I know. You don't have to tell me. And, and she's like, no, 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 SJ, no, no, you ate down. I went, I know, I'm sorry. I, I go, should I tell Jill? Should I talk to Jill? Did she eat down? Did she... She did, Jill eats? Is that what I'm telling? No, she goes, no, no, don't tell your wife she eats. You, you ate down, you look good. I said, just say look good. <laughs> All right, definitions matter. Now that we've got some clarity on the meanings of some words, would you put that little paragraph back up? Now let's read this with some understanding. Doug's message last week was, I'm just telling you kind of chill, Dad. It was pretty good. I'm not even lying. He talked about girl math, and I was like, wow, that's funny. The song he picked after the message, it was fantastic. Doug did a really great job. <laughs> and there you go. Definitions matter. Say, Sean, what's the point? <laughs> the point is, when we talk about the tithe, definition matters. I hear this word thrown around all the time in church, and, some, and often it's not referring to 10% of someone's income. In fact, I'll hear a lot of people go, here's, I, here's my tithe, and, and, and I know like that's not 10% of their income, and, and, but just so you know, in 20 years, I've never once went, well, statistically speaking, Jerry, that's not actually a tithe, you see. Not once, okay? But what I've thought is, oh, shoot. I don't think he actually knows what that word means. 
And maybe you're like, well, what's the point? Like giving, generosity, tithe, offering, it's all the same, it's semantics. Here, here's, here's, the only way, here's the only time I get con- concerned for you as your pastor. I don't want you to give an amount of money to God and it's not a tithe, but you call it a tithe. And because you call it a tithe, you read a verse like what we started out with that promises he'll open up the floodgates of heaven to people who tithe and you start holding on to a promise that you don't actually qualify for. That's what I don't want for you. I want you to, to know, there's like 7,000 approximately, approximately promises from God in the Bible. His promises come with premises. They come with qualifications. This particular subject, he says, if you tithe, that's 10%. If you tithe, test me. I'll open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing you won't be able to contain it. I don't want you to give 3% of your income and and call it a tithe. And you call it a tithe so much that you think it's a tithe. And then you hold on to a promise that's not coming your way. You see what I'm saying? Now, I'm not saying... There's situations where you go, man, I I can't. I couldn't tithe if I wanted. Start with 1%. Start with 2%. Start small. Make it recurring. Make it matter. Work towards the tithe. Like, that's awesome stuff. That's what I did. I just want you to know what this promise says and what the qualification for it is, and I don't want you to have a misunderstanding. It'd be like my son Ashton. uh, You know, he's growing like crazy. He's like a foot and a half taller than me right now. Like, I don't think I'm the father. You know what I mean? I'm kidding. Come on, guys, relax. So, but let's say he goes, Dad, I outgrew all my basketball shoes. I got a game on Wednesday. And I say, okay, son, clean your full room. Clean the whole thing. You clean your entire room. I'll get you a pair of basketball shoes for Wednesday. And he goes and cleans 3% of his room. And in his mind, clean my room. Dad said, if I clean my room, I get new shoes. Now he's holding on to a promise that says, because I clean my room, I'm getting new shoes. And Wednesday's going to roll around and he's going to be barefoot. Because he was holding on to a promise that he didn't qualify for. You see what I mean? That's the only reason I want you to know exactly what it means and exactly what this promise was referring to. Tithing is returning. Tithing is 10%. And, and number three, um, sorry, I got all my stuff. Tithing is to God through your local church. And again, definitions matter. Watch what God says about it. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Tithing is 10% and it's to God through your local church. Now listen, there's a bunch of you that are new to the church. I know because the thing keeps growing. And that means there's a whole bunch of you that we haven't had enough time together for for us to get a chance to earn your trust. And I know that you could hear a message like this and go, well, that's pretty convenient. I said it earlier. The people who work at the church seem to want us to give to the church. Let me try to take some of this worrisome, maybe even pessimistic thoughts. Let me try to take some of this off the table for you. Here's my honest thoughts on that. Take your tithe. Take God up on this and tithe it to some other church. Keep coming here. We'll still help you park your car. Someone will still welcome you at the door. We'll still make coffee. We'll still run the sound and the lights and the tech. And and the worship team will sing songs to try to help you enter and experience the presence of God. And a bunch of us will get up here and do our best to talk about the word of God. And we'll pray for you. And we'll teach your kids about Jesus. And send your tithe somewhere else. I mean that. We're not trying to build Red Rocks Church Kingdom. We're trying to build God's kingdom. That's what this place is about. And I want you to have life to the fullest until you get to heaven. That's what we want. But God's very specific. This goes to him through the local church. But see, sometimes, and I I bring this up because we, and I say we because I've done it too, we play games with God that we would never let our kids play with us. Like this, here's what I mean. Ashton, I said clean your entire room. Well, I didn't clean my entire room, but dad, I went to Scout's house and we made a mess in his room and I helped him clean up part of his room. So that should apply to cleaning up my room. It's getting quiet. (laughs) Dad, I didn't clean my whole room, but I fed the dog and that should apply to cleaning my whole room. No, son, I've told you if you go to someone's house and make a mess, I want you to be respectful I want you to clean up after yourself. I asked you to feed the dog. You don't get to apply those things to the first thing I asked you to do. 
Because you fed the dog doesn't mean your room's any cleaner. Because you cleaned someone else's house doesn't mean you cleaned your room yet. I ask you to do that first. See, but, but we play these games with God, don't we? I've done it, I've done it. I look at my year-end statement and I'm like, do we really need to give more through the church? Because I mean, Jill apparently gave to 17 things that were advertised on K-Love. <laughs> that should apply to my tithe. And, and I give to Compassion and we give to the Denver Rescue Mission and we give to people in need. Like, and I'm adding all those things up and it looks like a tithe and God's going, no, no, no. I asked you to clean your room first. You don't get to apply cleaning someone else's room to cleaning your room. Well, I fed the dog. Well, I, I'm not tithing, but I mean, I'm serving. That should apply. Oh, it got real quiet now. God's like, no, that's also something I want you to do. And trust me, I'm gonna change your life through the process, but you don't get to apply that to this. This is separate. This is different. If you want to tithe, this is what it looks like. It's 10% to God through the local church. And he says, if you do, test me, trust me, watch what I'll do in your life. That's the promise I really want us to understand today. And maybe you go, man, you don't understand what I've been through. You don't understand what I'm going through. You don't know how tight things are. You don't know how hard life is for me. I know how triggering this subject can be. Because again, when, when I first was introduced to it, I had nothing but debt. Didn't have, have my own place to live. Didn't have my own car. Living on a futon. Like, I get it. And, and I'm so grateful that this pastor took the time to encourage me, even though I did not make it easy on her. And she said, listen, it always takes faith. If you have next to nothing, 10% feels crazy. And if you have a whole bunch, 10% feels crazy. She said, and the truth is, it actually gets harder to be obedient with the tithe the more you have. Now, I didn't believe her. And most of you don't either, because we always think the same thing. When I get there, if I had more, then I will, right? I can't now because I'm in school. Things are tight. But when I, well, I mean, I just graduated. I'm in college. I just graduated college. I'm just trying to get my feet. I'm just, you know, when I have more, then I will. Well, I'm saving up for a ring right now, bro. But when I have more, I, well, I'm trying to get a car. I'm trying to get a house. Oh, man, we're about to have kids. But when we get to this, then I will. Ah, oh, kids' sports are crazy. Kids' college, have you ever put a kid through college? It's crazy. But when I get to, and if we're not careful, we'll put off this act of obedience that isn't about how much God loves us. It's about what God can and wants to do in and through us. And we'll miss out on this entire thing, our entire life, thinking, I don't have enough to start yet. And, and this pastor said, she said, Sean, God says, test me. He says he'll bless your life in ways you can't even contain it. She, she said, I know you have next to nothing. That means your tithe will be next to nothing. But you'll still be being obedient. And you've never needed his blessing more than you do right now. Why would you want to put this off for two years? You need it now. Now's the perfect time to start. And, and then if you have a whole bunch, the temptation is, well, I can't give that much away. 10% of what I make, that's crazy. I'll give a lot. I'll give a good amount, I'll give enough, but I'm not giving 10% of what I made because that would be crazy. It always takes the same amount of faith no matter how much we have. And it's never easy at first, but I promise you it's one of these things, me and Jill have been doing it for 26 years of marriage now, and, and, and I'm telling you one of these days you're gonna start and you're gonna look back and you're gonna go, oh my gosh, thank God we finally took that step of obedience because look what God did in our life. Look what he did in our family. Look what he's done with our purpose. Look how he's building our legacy. Look at how people are coming to heaven and I get to be a part of it. That's what this thing's all about. And I'll never forget the first day I did it. I was scared to death. We didn't have a cool app. I went into the church office and said, take 10% and make it recurring and put it towards what you call a tithe and do it every paycheck. And I was scared to death. But I'll never forget walking out of that church building that day, the, the amount of peace and freedom I felt. I still had 60,000 in debt. I still had no possessions. I still didn't have a place to live of my own. I still didn't own a car. Like I still, every, and I couldn't have had more peace and felt more free because for the first time in my life, I got to go, I don't know how this is gonna turn out, but you do. And you said I could test you and I just tithed. So the test just started. Let's see what you got. 
and it was awesome. And that's what I want for you. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to be free, free from this grip of putting our hope in something that, that goes away so fast and is so untrustworthy. He says, I want your hope and your confidence and your life built upon me. On, I want to be the foundation for your life. Because if you make that possible, it's going to change the game. That's what he wants for us, I believe. Now, let's get real practical for a second and then we'll pray. Actually, we'll watch a video, then I'll pray. I'm not asking you to do anything. No one at this church is going to ask you to do anything. Our only ask, it's really just a challenge, and it's for you, is ask God. Ask God. God, you know where we're at. You know where I'm at. What do you want from me right now? What for me is obedience right now? Ask God. And then get in the word and let him speak to you. Don't just talk to Rick, all right? Let him speak through his word, but ask God. Maybe for some of you, he'll say, look, the way your life is set up right now, you couldn't tithe if you had to. So start small, but make it recurring. For some of you, it would be, well, I'll just start tithing now. Like the best time to plant a tree was you know, 15 years ago, but the second best time is today. I'll start now. For some of you, on December 8th, when we take this big offering as a church family, your year-end gift, your year-end offering, what if you actually just tithed on 2024? What if you started there? This is going to be the first year when I'm actually going to be able to, to, to look at God and go, I'm being financially obedient, me, my family, as for us, we choose, we will serve the Lord. And my finances in every part of my life go to you first. And for some of you, you go, man, I already do this. I'm already tithing. That's great. That's, that's where me and my family are at. That's where a lot of us are at. Then that's when we get to ask that question, God, based on everything that you've done for us. What would you have me do with the 90% I have left? What would you have me do this year to build your kingdom and not just mine? And look, I know for a bunch of you, you go, man, for me to do something like this, like, bro, I'd have to like change so much of my life. Like I'm stretched thin. I mean, I'd have to get rid of like $100 worth of subscriptions a month. Like Amazon and Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus and ESPN Plus and I get six Starbucks a week and I go out to lunch three times and bro for me to live this way I'd have to like rearrange my entire life around Jesus and I think Jesus goes yeah I know that's the point Deuteronomy 14, 23, the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. He doesn't want our money. He wants our life because he knows when he has our life, the sky's the limit to what he can do in and through us. I'm going to show you a two-minute video. If you've ever given at this church, I want you to watch this video and I want you to sense the purpose behind it. I want you to allow God to remind you your giving is what's making stories like this possible. You're a part of every single life change story. Church, over 2,700 people got baptized in 2024. And if you've given here, your sacrifice and your obedience is a part of every one of those lives being changed. If you've never given, but maybe today you feel like God might be stirring something up in you, watch these stories and look what you could be a part of. And then here's the last thing. I believe so many people are gonna give their life to God this weekend and the irony is, is we talked about money. Watch this video. If you're new to this whole thing, I want you to hear story after story after story, life change after life change after life change. Broken, 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 healed, healed, healed. I want you to see that God is still on the throne, that he still does miracles, that he still changes lives. And I want you to realize if he could change their life, he could change my life. That's what I want you to think as you watch this. Deal? All right, roll that video. I just remember a lot of my childhood feeling really alone. I really made a mess of my life. Being told that I was a mistake and that I was unworthy. I went through abuse and neglect. I found myself in this relationship that ended up being an abusive relationship. I started dating someone when I was 16 and, and so that introduced me to a lot of alcohol. Alcohol and drugs and alcohol and stress. Didn't know what to do and I turned to drinking again. Like I'm so empty inside. I was a very lost person for a very long time. I got a stage 
kids for diagnosis. I just didn't know where to go from there. Debilitating anxiety and depression. You know, I didn't want to be on this earth anymore. I didn't want to be in this world anymore. I was sitting down and I was praying for him to take it away. I actually attempted to kill myself. I kind of just wanted it to be over. I tried to take my life twice. God didn't let it happen. God saved my life on January, January 1st, March 8th, 2023. 2023. In that moment, I was like, okay, like maybe this is like my come to Jesus moment. I know I wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for God. And by his stripes, we are healed. And I have to share this story. You know, God still heals. God's still God. Because I have the Lord and I have a beautiful community behind me, I know that no obstacle is bigger than my God. One day somebody said, let's go to church. And my friend invited me to church with her. And it was the first time I'd ever walked into a church. I remember being so nervous and I was just sitting in the back left corner and it was this feeling of coming home. I'm home. I'm where I need to be. And I just want to follow him forever and like scream off of the rooftops and be like, Jesus is real and he loves you. <laughs> and I decided that day I was going to give my life back to Jesus. I took my questions to God and he answered them. Times where I didn't feel like there was a way out. I know that God had good plans for my life. I just got more life and joy and happiness through following Jesus. It is literally like night and day now that I have put him first. Red rocks and God has also shown me that it's okay to be imperfect. <laughs> hey, you can have a relationship with God too. You just have to show up and trust him to take care of the rest. I heard a voice and it was just like, I'm not done with you yet. Like he met me there and he met me at my lowest. He sought after me and he caught me and he brought me back to the flock. I didn't even completely get on both knees before he came running and it just so reminded me of the story of the prodigal son. For that person that may feel broken and that person who may feel like their sin is too great. That's how I felt the first day I walked into Red Rocks, but I was truly showed that God will show you so much mercy and grace if you just surrender it all to him. Would you stand up with me at all locations? Church, that's why we do everything we do. Because it's not a game. Heaven's real, hell's real, God's real, Satan's real. Satan really does want to steal, kill, and destroy every single one of our lives and the people we love. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. I came that you would have life and have it to the full. That's why we do this. That's why we get together like this. This is the locker room. We get together. We are reminded of why we do what we do so that we can go hit the field and watch God use us to change the world. And I love what that girl said. She said, I, I had to realize that God's not done with me yet. And I believe some of you need to hear that right now. This is for somebody. God's not done with you yet. Your story's not over. You can get through this. You can overcome. He is bigger. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God's not done with you. And everything we do when we do this is so we can still take that message to the world. That Jesus still forgives sins. God still, he, still heals. He's still on the throne. He still renews and redeems and restores broken people and broken lives and fills us with his spirit so we can get through things in this world we never could on our own and we get heaven forever and we won't stop proclaiming that message until he comes back. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you're with us. I thank you that you're speaking. I thank you that you care. I thank you that you see us. I thank you that you're with us. With everyone's eyes closed, I wanna ask two questions. Just give you a chance to respond to what God might be doing in your life. First off, I wanna pray for anybody who you or somebody you love is going through a very difficult season right now. And you say, I need the God of the universe to do some miracles in our lives, in our family, in some loved ones. If that's you, raise your hand and we're gonna pray and agree together. My hand's up there with you. Second question is this. We talked about money, but the truth is God talked to you today about your life about your heart and you heard these stories and you went, wait a second, that's what I need. I need life change. I feel too broken. I feel unworthy. I feel like I'm not worth being loved. I feel like he wouldn't want me. And I've just began to realize I can feel it in my heart. He's trying to draw me back right now. The God of the universe wants you to know you're loved, you're valued, you're welcomed. He wants you to come home. He wants to forgive your sins. 
put his spirit in your life and give you heaven forever. And today you go, I want that. If that's you right now, raise your hand and I'm going to say a prayer for you. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Yes. Yes. I see you. I see both of you down front. I see you right there. Yes. Amen. 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 God, you knew why we were here today. You knew why we were in these buildings. You knew why we were watching online and listening online. God, speak, change, heal in Jesus name. Remind us that you have great plans for us and that you're a great God and nothing is impossible for you. And I pray for miracles to start happening in Jesus' name, in finances, in relationships, in health, in anxiety, in depression. We need you, God. Our hope is in you. And for every person who just raised their hand, I thank you for the eternal lives that are being changed right now in Jesus' name. God, it is our honor as a church to worship you with music. We love you. Thank you. And everybody said, amen. Red Rocks Church, let's worship.
Amen. That song slaps, yo. No cap. You know what I mean? You're looking at me like, do you know what you mean? Kind of. Halfway there. Man, heaven just got more crowded today. Can we make some noise in this room and up in overflow? That's so cool. It's crazy to me that uh, a guy who a lot of you have never met preaching from a different state on a screen talking about money and heaven just got that much more crowded. God is good like we just sang. A guy who uh, 25 years ago walked into church uh, with cocaine in his leather jacket, strung out from the night before, just desperate for something real and gave his life to Jesus. And then I've watched him go through the journey of, of not enjoying preaching this topic to now becoming one of the best communicators in the world because I've seen firsthand him live it out. And uh, we're here uh, because he lives that out. And uh, if you just gave your life to Jesus, man, congratulations. And uh, if you're wondering what the heck do I do now, uh, if you just text the word yes to 30301, we want nothing from you. We, we just have some resources and some next steps that you can take at your pace. But congratulations on the greatest decision you will ever make. God is good, amen? Oh, if you need prayer for anything, we have an amazing prayer team who would love to pray with you in the prayer area or the prairie on your way out. So stop and get some prayer. Um, and, and to give you just some simple action steps as clear as possible to follow up what Sean just talked about. If uh, once again, this is not obligation, this is invitation. And if giving is not something yet that you get to do and still something you have to do, you are still missing a key part of the Father's heart towards you. Keep showing up and keep coming back because the more you get to know this God's heart, the more it's gonna start to change yours. I have found, as has Sean, that my journey of generosity has seemed to accelerate that process of me getting to know God and God changing me. And if you feel led to take a step and you maybe you wanna try tithing, maybe you wanna take a first baby step towards that, we invite you every single week to do it this way on the app. You can give redrocksaucin.com slash give. You can give online. You can set up recurring giving and start baking this into the cadence of your life. God, I don't just want this week blessed. I want my life blessed and everything you have for me. I want to make this part of my life. You can put cash or check in the basket on your way out. If you are hurting, you can take cash from the basket on your way out. If you can't get groceries today, unless you do that, then you take whatever it is that you need. Um, and then and then above and beyond that, you, you, you probably saw a card that was on your seat. There's a QR code. This is the end of year offering that we've mentioned a few times. And uh, we're going to do an invitation next week to, to do that and then the following weekend to do that as well. But the truth is, if you're feeling that and God is speaking to you, you can do that now. You can do that this week. You can do that whenever you would like. But thank you. Um, 
to all of you who faithfully give to help us build this dream. And uh, as, as, as true kingdom builders, it's, it's one of the greatest honors of my life to get to pastor a church that is so generous. And uh, for all we've seen, we ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, welcome party starts at 11.45 in 13 minutes. Um, and if that's a great next step, if you wanna learn more about this church and really figure out, is this the place I wanna plant myself in? Because if it's not, you might as well find out. You know what I mean? Get all, and I, I pray that it is, all my cards on the table. But I think you'll really enjoy Welcome Party out those doors and to the left at 11.45. Um, Financial Peace University is something that we do at the start of every year. And um, it is a, it's a class that we're gonna do, I believe, Tuesday nights in this room? Tuesday nights, yes. Um, starting in January, I was just talking to somebody last night, recently married, I said, the greatest thing that you can do now for your marriage is for you and your new spouse to go through Financial Peace University. Invest into your future, this will change your life. Uh, and we had a couple who did it years ago and it changed their lives so much that they just paid for anybody who wants to do it. And so take advantage of this opportunity. Taylor Thorne is at the table right outside these doors. Go to that FPU table and sign up for that. Do not miss out on that opportunity. And guys, thank you for being part of Kingdom Builders. Next week is week four. We've talk generosity and next week we're going to talk faith and we're going to talk vision and I've had a message on my heart for a few months now. I am going to tell us the story of everything God has done over the first six years of this church so that it collectively builds our faith because I want to share with you some vision and some prayers I have for what I believe God is about to do through this church and I want to ask you to be here and I want to ask you to show up with all the faith that you got next week. Amen? Sound good? You guys enjoy the beautiful fall weather. We'll see you next week. In the meantime, you stay classy, Austin. Love you guys.